Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kevin Nagokin, and I would like to welcome you to this year's Robert M. Pachras Memorial Lecture. Dr. Pachras was a member of the Penn State Journalism faculty from 1948 to 1977. His teaching specialties were radio news writing, public opinion, and popular culture. And he loved to travel. For these reasons, and to honor him in, that, in, in these ways, uh, speakers from this lecture series are notable experts in popular culture, public opinion, and international communications. Dr. Pachras was possibly best known for his dedication to students, not only when they were enrolled here on campus, but after they left Penn State. For many years, in fact, he edited the school's alumni news, keeping in touch with hundreds of alumni. Dr. Pachras was... Um, Excuse me, he once attributed his great ability to remember the names and faces of countless graduates to the fact that he had, for years, edited the alumni notes. But those close to him knew that it was really because he cared so much about students as human beings. The purpose of this lecture is to honor Dr. Pachras' memory and his many contributions to the former School of Journalism. This lecture series was endowed through scores of gifts contributed in his honor, the most significant of which have been made recently by Judith Hardy's of, of Phoenix, a 1952 Penn State graduate with family ties to the institution. Her father, Anthony Lushek, was founding director in 1947 of the Labor Education Program in Extension Services here at Penn State. When Judith learned of the Pachris Lecture, she contacted us, saying how much she had admired Bob Pachris' commitment and talent for teaching. On behalf of the Pachris Coordination Committee, Joe Dumas, uh, Michael Olavsky and Matt McAllister. We'd also like to thank others for making the Pachris Lectureship possible, including, including Dean Doug Anderson, Associate Dean Murray Harden, and Steve Samsel of the College of Communications, and Cheryl McCallops of the University Libraries. I'd now like to introduce Professor Ford Grizzly, who is head of our Department of Journalism, and who in turn will introduce this year's Pachris speaker. Ford? Thanks. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Carolyn Kitch. Carolyn is a professor of journalism at Temple University's School of Media and Communications. She also teaches in the school's doctoral program and has been a uh, faculty director for the school's study abroad program in London and Dublin. Carolyn's research and teaching areas include uh, memory studies, media history, journalism theory, magazines, gender studies, and visual communication. In addition to numerous journal articles, she has published four books. The Girl in the Magazine Cover, The Origins of Visual Stereotypes in American Mass Media, Pages from the Past, History and Memory in American Magazines, Journalism in a uh, Culture of Grief, co-authored with Janice Hume, and Pennsylvania in Public uh, Memory, Reclaiming the Industrial Past, which is public, uh, published by Penn State University Press. Carolyn earned a bachelor's degree from Boston University, a master's degree from Penn State, and a PhD from Temple. She serves on the editorial board of nine scholarly journals and is an associate editor of Journalism and Mass Communication Quarter. She is also a former writer and editor for Reader's Digest, McCall's, and Good Housekeeping magazine. As a friend, I won't say old friend, but as a friend, uh, I can also say that Carolyn does not like to, smot, small, uh, does not like to fly on small planes. <laughs> Uh, she's a truly terrible pool player, uh, but she's also a lot of fun and, one, and truly one of the brightest and most creative scholars studying mass media history. So please welcome Penn State, Carolyn Kipp. I'm a terrible but enthusiastic pool player. <laughs> thank you for it. And Thank you for having me here. Um, I am very honored to have been asked to do this and to be part of this event. And I'm pleased to have the chance to share with you some ideas and some questions about public communication that have captured my interest in recent years. Some of what I'm going to talk about today is based on past research, chiefly a book I edited, I, I co-authored with James Hume called Journalism in a, in a Culture of Grief. Some of it has to do with what I'm working on now, and I'm not even sure where it's going, uh, about ongoing research, about events and places that I'm still trying to understand. And the nature of that current work was inspired by the kind of research I did for the Pennsylvania and Public Memory book that was published by Penn State Press, um, it, it, for which I ended up, it was the, it was the pro research project that just took on a life of its own. 
uh, for five years, driving all over the state, um, looking, going to historic sites and museums and tourist attractions that had to do with memory of industrialization and its loss, um, with community efforts to cope with deindustrialization. And so, um, it, and the point is, um, whenever, I, especially with this past project, whenever I try to explain the kinds of research topics I've been interested in lately, many people, especially my colleagues in my department of journalism, I'm in a department of journalism, say, huh, you're doing what? It used to be easier for me to explain myself. My initial, um, and, and to some extent still continuing, research interest was in the history of media, um, Ford's area, especially magazines, the industry in which I uh, worked for 11 years. And I studied media in the media of the past. I did my work in archives and libraries. Out of that work, though, grew my own questions about what gets saved and what doesn't, about which historical events and people are better known and better remembered than others, about how that shared historical knowledge gets into our heads and stays there. And these are questions about memory, a word by which I mean not individual recollection, but a social process involving public communication. So now, even though I'm still interested in the past and do sometimes still work with old media, um, I'm more likely to be studying media of the present to find out how they use the past and explain the past. And while I still um, look in library databases and sometimes archives for that media evidence, I also have begun to look beyond media evidence into public space itself. Whether we call it social memory or collective memory or public memory, which is the term I tend to use given my interest in memory as a form of public communication, as a communication scholar, people who study this phenomenon are interested in how the past is recalled in different ways and for different purposes um, in the present. The present, of course, shifts in the present over time. Um, and I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that. Uh, nearly, nearly a century ago, French sociologist Maurice Hallbox described this phenomenon as a process of constantly retouching of portraits to create a picture in which, and these are his words, new images overlay the old. So the old painting is still there. It's not erased, but there, there's more painting on top of it, and it's a constant process. One key premise of this field is that memory is constructed and communicated through narratives through stories. That premise raises at least these four questions. First, what is the story? How does it get created? Oops, sorry. Second, um, how does the story change over time? Third, how does that story travel across place? How is it told differently in different places, which changes over time? And finally, who has the authority to tell the story? And that changes over time and sometimes varies across place. Here is an answer to one answer to that last question. This is a mural in West Belfast, Northern Ireland. Although all of the other examples I'm going to talk about today are American, I'm going to start and end um, with pictures from Belfast. And I'll, expl I'll explain why at the end of my talk. I've included this one here because of its point. Uh, a well-known phrase, uh, which is that, that what we think of history is really a story. It's always a story. Someone has chosen some things to put in and some things to leave out. And what we think the past means depends also on who has the power to tell the story, something that changes over time. This is one assumption behind what I'm talking about today. Before I go to my, my many specific, well, several specific examples, and most of the rest of the slides are mainly pictures, um, I'm going to ask you to bear with a few more words um, so that I can briefly offer some, uh, some definitions of some of the other assumptions. In part because memory studies grew out of Holocaust studies, much of the research in this area tends to be concerned with very serious subjects, with the question of how people of the present feel a moral obligation to people and events of the past and serve as ongoing witnesses to something that should not be forgotten. Dolores Hayden calls this feeling moral imagination, and I'll be using that term today. Memory studies draw on theory from a range of academic disciplines, 
But increasingly, scholars across those disciplines are interested in the role of media, and of journalism in particular, in memory, and how it serves as, to use another well-known phrase, the first draft of history. How it publicly defines the meaning of ma major events and how it acts as a moral witness and a memory preserver. <coughs> what news media produce can be understood as witnessing texts. In cases of shocking violence, journalism not only reports the event itself, but also witnesses and conveys the public reaction, public sorrow or outrage. It is, to use historian John Bodnar's term, a vernacular response. Um, the, the reaction of people um, it, that is captured in journalism it is usually expressed in, uh, by ordinary people in public space. This expression takes material and behavioral form. That vernacular culture is at first local, but is nationalized and amplified when it is featured in journalism. The most common example of this phenomenon is news coverage of a kind of crime um, that is um, consistently reported as unthinkable, um, even though it's now, unfortunately, rather regular. Um, when, what seem to be random killings of many people in the kinds of places we assume are safe. An elementary school, a church, a college classroom, a shopping mall, a movie theater. These are powerful news stories for audiences, not only because we feel terrible for the victims, but also because these events could have happened to any of us. And therefore, we imagine how we would have felt, what we would have done. These news stories have several consistent components that inspire imaginative connection to the story. First person accounts put us inside the event itself. Cultural studies scholar Maria Sturgeon uses the word fantasy, um, and she's coming from, it's coming from Freud, uh, to describe this, this mental process of reenactment, um, an imaginative connection in which we, we mentally put ourselves into the story and the event which we replay in our head. The profile of the killer also invites us to speculate about motive. This story is partly a logistical one, how did he plan it, but also a moral and almost mythic one. How could this kind of monster live among us? In their profiles, the victims are praised as heroes. We learn as stories of selfless behavior amid the chaos, and yet their life stories are full of ordinary details. Relationships, relationships, occupations, hobbies, idiosyncrasies that remind us of ourselves and our family members and our friends. Finally, the local community's response usually includes photographs of spontaneous memorials and of public ceremonies, images through which we can feel a sense of participation in the process of mourning and memorial. My point here is that journalism is central to this. Um, and, and I'm especially interested in this last bit, which I'll, I'm going to um, use as a foundation for the main events I'm talking about today. This kind of coverage is a good example of how moral witnessing blurs the role of people in public space and the journalists who report on them and show their rituals. Coverage that allows us, the broader audience, to witness the event, to make an empathetic connection with these other people. Um, and I think this is too, this is, uh, sort of um, coverage is too often dismissed as sensational. I mean, it, it does involve the senses. Um, I think it's actually an important function of journalism, an important cult cultural function, and as a reminder of why we use the word media. Those newspapers, um, and obviously other kinds of media, are at the center of this communicative process. They make, they make visible vernacular tributes and the local landscape itself a double act of witnessing that reinforces the audience's imaginative connection with the local people in the place who suffered the incident. In the cases of individual shocking events like these, it is this imaginative connection that has the potential to link such stories together into a broader and continuing discussion of values and identity, cultural discussion, in which journalism is important. We can see this phenomenon occurring in other kinds of stories as well, not only stories of violent crime, um, but also stories about victims of natural disasters and social injustices, whose suffering spark or conditions spark a moral response. Think, for instance, of Hurricane Katrina, a moral response to a natural disaster. When that is, response is especially strong, those stories are more likely to, to survive in public memory and to travel into other forms of cultural expression 
and to be reshaped over time. That's supposed to be blank. Um, I want to turn now to two such stories. Both illustrate the relationship between news and public memory, and between official national narratives and vernacular place-based narratives. Both of them provoked such strong moral reactions that they gained considerable staying power in public memory, and yet their memory has evolved in contrasting ways. One of them, like the events I just showed you, began as a single violent event on one day, um, and was initially understood as a national story featuring people who were just like us. The other began as a series of events over many years that were initially understood as a regional problem involving people who were unlike the mainstream media audience. And today these things are kind of flipped in these stories. News coverage was absolutely the first draft of both of these stories in terms of how the broader public knew about them at all or understood what the stories were. But news has remained central to the telling of only one of them, whereas vernacular culture has taken over the telling of the other one. In one case, there are living witnesses and visual images of the event. In the other case, there are none of either. Many years ago, in the 1950s, a man named Freeman Tilden, who was a, a journalist who became interested in public history, um, wrote, a, wrote a book uh, about, uh, mainly for the National Park Service, about how important it was to do the kind of historical interpretation that would bring the past alive for the general public, the Amer American history. Historical interpretation, he argued, should, and these are his words, provoke in the mind of the hearer the questions, what would I have done in similar circumstances? What would have been my fate? Sure enough, half a century later, I heard those exact questions asked by an interpreter as I sat in a windy field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where United Flight 93 crashed on September 11, 2001. How many of you have been there? Um, the first time, I, how many of you have been there in the last two years? Okay. How many of you were there before? Um, how many of you were there more than three years ago? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, the first time I visited there, which, which was about ten years ago, I sat with a dozen or so other people as a local volunteer narrated the details of the disaster. This was an, an, uh, an older man. Um, who was retired and, and would go out and tell the story um, to visitors um, it, with, the, with the help of, of the National Park Service maintaining the site. He concluded by asking us, what would we have done? He said, would we have been heroes too? Every weekend, still, visitors gather in this windy field to hear the story of Flight 93. The last time I heard it, which was this past July, I was one of more than 250 people listening to it although I confess I have blundered into a voice about January week. I was there in the middle of July. Since the crash, more than two million people have trekked to this out-of-the-way place in western Pennsylvania, even though the memorial is still not completely finished. The main characters and narrative of the story of Flight 93 were drafted, literally, in news coverage almost immediately. The story on the left here appeared in the New York Times on September 13th. From the start, however, this was a kind of story that invited empathy and vivid imagination, and those elements of its drama grew as the story was soon retold in books and a fictional film. The crash site itself is in a very rural area, on a windy hill, and it is weirdly, peacefully beautiful. <coughs> there on the left um, is the road that led to the first temporary memorial. I took that picture in 2005 or 2007. I've been to, I go there frequently. Uh, the picture on the right is the only picture of the event itself. Um, it's actually just an index of the event, uh, of the smoke, and it was taken by a local resident. Uh, there are no news, news images of this disaster. This site not only invites imagination, but requires it, because the event itself is invisible. That absence of official witnessing texts creates a void that was filled by vernacular witnessing texts, <coughs> most of them forms of visual communication. The nature of this vernacular witnessing has been not documentary, but material and behavioral, and ongoing. The open landscape aided this cultural expression. There were no impediments as there were and still are in New York and Washington. You could just drive up. Um, and to, for people who wanted to come and leave things there. These circumstances combined with how long 
the official memorial was delayed, allowed visitors and local residents to take an unusually active role in shaping its commemoration. Here's what used to be at the top of that hill. This temporary memorial, which was there for nine years, was a large and constantly evolving piece of folk art. Its elements grew and moved around. Um, these pictures show it on different sides of the road because at one point it was moved across the road due to disputes about land ownership. Uh, but there was always a big fence to which people could attach things and there were other tributes arranged around it. Among <coughs> them were the rows of angels that appeared within a day after the crash. You may remember seeing these in the news coverage. These little angels were sort of the iconic news image of the event itself. As well as benches engraved with the names of passengers. Also a vernacular tribute. Somebody did this. Um, and uh, and uh, not an official National Park Service thing. Um, sorry. Some of the items attached to the fence were messages of gratitude to the passengers. Like this. And I think this is a really interesting a definite 21st century definition of folk art. Um, visitors also wrote messages on the fence's support beams and on the guardrails that had been put up simply to indicate where to park. I did not put that bumper sticker there. It was there. <laughs> uh, notice that all of these are signed with people's names. This is direct communication <coughs> between people who signed their names and the dead. Over the years, people left all sorts of things at this site. Not only the usual stuffed animals, but also hockey pucks, action figures, hair ties, license plates, coins, bracelets, rocks, seashells, baseball caps, even dirt bike racing trophies. Many objects were statements of the giver's identity, often sports related and regional. Um, also this poem from a car club in nearby Johnstown, the Blood City Demons. Other objects made more direct thematic connections to the events of September 11th even if they were not necessarily connections to the story of Flight 93. So for instance, this big board um, was put up to hold the insignia patches of police and fire departments from around the country and in some cases around the world. Extending the narrative of the World Trade Center site, firefighters were especially featured, with tributes to them often made by motorcycle clubs. And indeed, this place was and still is a huge biker destination. Finally, this slide was also part of Christian tourism, and there were many religious gestures made at the temporary memorial from the dozens if not hundreds of crosses hung all over the site to the many, many little statues of angels and saints, um, some of them just put on the ground, uh, to the large cross that stood between the American and state flags for a very long time. And so, People visited the temporary memorial not only to pay tribute to the crew and passengers of Flight 93, but also to express their own identities, values, and beliefs, um, and, and hometowns and regions. Um, and they did this through material culture tributes. This went on for nine years. During that time, there was almost no news coverage, uh, certainly not national news coverage of the site. Um, it, in central and western Pennsylvania, there has been continuing coverage. Uh, but it has sort of gone out of the story, the national story of September 11th. And uh, except with the one exception being sort of an ongoing story about disputes between the National Park Service and the five people who own different parts of the land. Um, during that time, the National Park Service erected a little building, stationed, uh, you know, like one ranger in it. Um, and, but most of the maintenance was done by local volunteers, including the interpretation uh, a lot of interpretation, and the nature of the site stayed pretty much the same. And the cars and the bikers kept rolling in, and people kept leaving things. And of course, they were taken away and, and supposedly all saved. Um, but the same, the nature of the stuff they left remained really consistent. And then in the summer of 2010, it was all taken away. When construction finally began on the permanent memorial, the disappearance of the temporary memorial, as well as the closure of that road to the top of the hill, upset and confused visitors. Trust me, I was one of them. I knew it was gone, and I was still annoyed that the road was closed when I got there. Um, at, at the people who had, had been there before had come back with more stuff, and there was no place to put the stuff. This was not merely a transition, but a disruption of a ritual process of pilgrimage that by them was really well established. To serve as a temporary visitor center for the following year, uh, the National Park Service erected another little building on a viewing area, area overlooking the construction site. 
Uh, outdoors, outside, there was an official explanation of what had happened on that day on a sign attached to a fence that was much smaller and was cleaned off more regularly. Inside the, the building was the first professionally interpreted presentation of the story of Flight 93. This was done with texts on the walls explaining the events of the day as well as binders containing transcripts of the cockpit recorder, recorder and the phone, call, phone calls made by passengers. The little building included a small display of representative, on the left there, items that had been left on the earlier memorial, as well as cards on which visitors could write their thoughts and pin them to a bulletin board, which is a standard. Um, this is co quite common in, in many museums and certainly in the other September 11th sites. All of these elements can be found in the current site, except that the material culture tributes are back in storage, awaiting the opening of a new visitor center, supposed to open in 2015, where some of them will be displayed. The interpretation is more professionally done now on these signs that stand in the main plaza. You can also take a cell phone tour that really is an imaginative. You know, you stand there and it says, imagine this happening. Um, and the story of Flight 93 um, is still told by a person, but is not the kind of emotional tribute that I heard delivered by the local volunteer a decade ago. Now it's done by a National Park Service ranger, this is from July, um, and it, it's an intense account, packed with facts, logistics, numbers, the size of the plane, the capacity of the fuel tanks, the coordinates of the flight path, the crew's number of years of flight training, and a second-by-second -second account of what they and passengers did inside the plane. It's a really different kind of interpretation. Down the hill from this plaza is the main memorial, called the Wall of Heroes. 40 adjacent columns, each with one name on it. They're lined up much as the angels used to be, but nothing is attached to them. They are a monument, very stark and very clean. As you can see here on the left, the pathway down to the memorial is bordered by a sloping granite wall. And as I walk down the pathway, I notice that at regular intervals, there are little flat areas cut into the sloping wall. And I thought they might be benches. Um, but and, and, I, and later someone said, no, they were intended for what you saw, uh, because sure enough, you couldn't sit down on them because people had put stuff on them. I was, this is what was there when I went in July. I was struck by how remarkably similar these items were to the kinds of things people used to put on the fence. A lanyard from a sports camp at Michigan State, hair ties, a glass angel, and a signed t-shirt from, and baseball from a game that had taken place in Pittsburgh the previous weekend. So if they can, people will still leave things that are specific statements of who they are and where they're from. It's as if they're leaving calling cards. This site has resurfaced in news periodically, sometimes in unexpected ways, um, as when this photograph was widely published in news media in May of 2011 uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed. Here again are handwritten messages and signatures, as well as the physical presence of people, pilgrims on the land, even at a time when this was just a construction site. The story of Flight 93 also resurfaces in news media when annual ceremonies recall the attacks, most notably on the 10th anniversary in 2011, which was when the Wall of Heroes, which was the first official commemoration on the site, was unveiled, um, dedicated. But even this was a very a minor part, part of the story in most journalism, certainly national journalism. The Pittsburgh news media devoted significant coverage to it as a local story. The second story I want to discuss today began as a set of local stories caused by a problem that was initially considered regional in nature. That problem actually had existed for a long time before it became, for more than a century, before it became a national and international scandal in the middle of the 20th century thanks largely to its coverage by photojournalists and the then new medium of television news. At that time and ever since, even while other tellers have emerged, news media have remained central to the telling of the story, and that is the story of the American Civil Rights Movement. More than half a century later, public uh, memory of that movement, which is so much in the news these days because of the 50th anniversaries of various events, uh, starting last year and, and going into now. Um, public, but, but today and, and, and through that time, public memory of the, move, of the movement, the mental, imaginative, moral connections that we have in our heads take the form of news photographs. 
Some of these photographs became so famous that they are considered to be iconic, even though the slide is blank. My guess is that most of you are seeing a particular picture in your head, maybe several pictures. In your mind right now, you know what's going to be on the next couple of slides. What's going to be on the next couple of slides? Fire hose. Hmm? Fire hose. Civil rights movement, like police putting fire hoses. Fire, fire hoses? Yes. Uh, the I am a man. Um, placard. Right. Correct. The police dog tearing at the pants leg of one of the marchers. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Lincoln Memorial and the huge crowd of people who came to hear the events of that day. Yep. Yep. Well, I can just go home now. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You guys have It's okay. Um, and I, I put these in chronolo almost in chronological order. Some of them are a little bit mixed up. Um, so, um, Rosa Parks. And I'll, we'll come back to what that photo actually, later on I'll, I'll explain what that photo actually is. Not a picture of her arrest, but there's her mugshot, right? 1955. Um, lunch counter sit in Greensboro, North Carolina. The March on Washington. It, I have subtly put with my big blue arrow <laughs> no, the presence of photographers in this picture because they'll reappear in different form in just a few minutes. You forgot about that one. Yeah. Um, I, thought, I thought that would come up first. Um, uh, um, Elizabeth Eckford. Um, and the Little Rock Nine uh, integrating, I've gone back in time a little bit, 1957, James Meredith integrating the University of Mississippi. There are the ones you expected, the fire hoses. This is Birmingham, Alabama. Charles Moore's photography. Voting Rights March uh, from Selma to Montgomery. And remember, especially the, the photograph in the upper right. Um, in fact, I'll just quickly go back through them because you're going to see the, all of these in different form. Okay. Whoops, I'm sorry, I, I missed one. And that. And there, there, there's the Memphis uh, garbage worker strike. Okay. This is a sculpture located on the campus of the University of Mississippi, representing James Meredith's integration into, uh, of that school in 1962. It's interesting that he's shown here walking alone. Do you remember the photo? Two white men on either side of him. Uh, so it's an interesting change in the picture. It's not a replication of the picture, but um, it is, he is um, walking. Um, so in sort of a reenactment. Uh, the title of this artwork, which is dedicated in 2005, as you may be able to see on the top of the stone doorway, is courage. Unlike the other places, I, most of the other places I'm talking about today, I haven't been here, uh, and I found these uncredited photographs online. These also are from websites and a blog called Arkansas Ties, although I have been uh, to Little Rock High School uh, after it was uh, at, it, it, the National, at, actually before the National Park Service took it over, but after there was a little museum there, on an AJHA trip, actually. Um, it was uh, before the sculpture appeared on the grounds of the Arkansas State Capitol building in 2006. The sculpture is titled Testament. On the ground are plaques with quotes from the nine former students. Uh, this is one of them. You just look at <laughs> the bird crap. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> look at the words in it. The language about witnessing and testimony. The connection between past and future. The idea of passing the baton to future generations who must finish the work started by the ancestors. Here are all of the, the language of heritage, culture, memory. Here too is a visual act of testimony. On the website of another National Park Service site, the 54-mile um, route between Selma and Montgomery, Alabama, which is now a National Heritage Corridor, historic route. Um, and which we saw in that photo of the long line of marchers on the horizon. The boy who was photographed then, surrounded by the American flag, now stands here as an older man be beside a sculpture of his younger self. 
And his presence is important as a witness within the witnessing process. The other news photo we saw earlier is now a postage stamp, uh, recalling the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Like this man, former civil rights protesters figure prominently in current public communication about this part of the past. They serve as living witnesses to history. Several years ago, during an American Journalism Historian Association, you might be in this picture, <coughs> see if you can find yourself. Um, several years ago, I, I visited, uh, our group visited 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where a bomb blast in 1963 killed four little girls. Earlier that same year, there had been a protest event called the Children's Crusade, or the Children's Campaign, in which hundreds of um, African American school students, most of them teenagers, a few of them younger, have marched through the streets of Birmingham, Alabama. Although their protest was nonviolent, those children were turned back by powerful blasts of water shot from fire hoses and by police dogs <coughs> trained on them. Um, you've seen these images. In the basement of this church is a large room where the story is told in wall displays uh, featuring. Uh, mainly photographs, also newspaper front pages, kind of conventional museum display. But upstairs in the church, church pews, we sat and listened to a man in his 60s tell us the story from his own memory. In 1963, he had been 16 years old. He had been one of the martyrs. Today, he is one of the many volunteers at such sites who are called foot soldiers. This is a term they themselves use. They are foot soldiers. What especially drew my interest was this park across the street into which many of the teenagers had fled as they were being attacked in 1963. The statue you see along the walkway is the back side of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., whose views are echoed in this sculpture at the other end of this walkway. This is a diagonal pathway going through the park. You can see the top of the church um, in the background. Uh, this is a traditional kind of memorial. And the wording on this ledge and to its right contains a typical kind of language in, in public memorials to violent events, place of revolution and reconciliation. But there's a circular pathway that goes through the park. And if you follow that circular pathway called the Freedom Walk, you encounter different kinds of sculptures. In fact, you have to walk through them. Here's one of them, depicting the children behind bars and the phrase, I ain't afraid of your jail. This is a slight rephrasing of, I ain't scared of your jail, which was uh, a phrase that became a, a slogan of civil rights activism at the time, as well as the title of the 1963 song by Pete Seeger. You can see the two sides of it, so that if you view it from a certain direction, and this is I took these, this is me running around the thing. Um, if, you, if you're in a certain, on a certain angle, it looks as if the children are in jail, but you have to walk in between. As you continue along the path, you have to walk through another set of walls out of which snarling dogs lunge. A little farther along, you walk past these huddled figures and wonder if, when you walk through the doorway, you might actually be hit by water from that sculpture of a fire hose. So I ran around it on the grass. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, that imaginative notion is one, and everybody walking up to it hesitated for a minute. That imaginative notion is one of the two reasons these sculptures were of particular interest to me. The other one is that what they create is not only the events themselves. They recreate the news photographs, the thing we represent, the thing that we, the tourist, or the people from the 21st century, recognize. In these cases, the, these photographs were taken by Charles Moore and appeared in Life magazine. So is the image that inspired this sculpture much more realist, also in the park. Uh, below it is the text of his 1995 dedication, a tribute to foot soldiers, warriors of a just cause, who had fought for liberty and justice for all. A phrase from the, pl the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, allegiance, not defiance. This is a story of allegiance, not defiance, but it transforms the event from a story of defiance and protest to a story of patriotism, even military sacrifice, the most mainstream of all possible American memory stories. My main point here is though, though is that in this park, sculpture is a form of media itself, and yet news images are absolutely central to how those sculptures inspire moral imagination. They're inextricable from that mediation, from the broader public memory. 
the journalistic first draft of history is still very much in place here. This is true as well at the site where the most famous civil rights foot soldier died for the cause. The former Lorraine Motel, which is uh, where the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968. Now it is the National Civil Rights Museum. This museum provides a thorough presentation of the many events of the 1950s and 60s, and they are recalled in a way that is simultaneously documentary and imaginative. Here, the Memphis Sanitation Worker Strike and the Woolworth Lunch Counter sit-ins are, are reenacted by sculpted figures. The striker figures, marching through a gauntlet of police bayonets, quite closely resemble the news photo we saw. Uh, the young people at the seated lunch counter here bear more resemblance to the television image shown on the screen behind them, and that's in the museum. These tableaux were done by a company called Studio Ice, and, it, and the last part is spelled E-I-S, but according to their website, that's how they pronounce it. And they do these kinds of figures for all sorts of historic sites, and they did the figures that are, if any of you have been to the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, all those founders marching around that you have to walk through, were done by this company. Um, and, and this is one of their promotional photographs on their, on their, sort of in, in their website promoting their business uh, to historic organizations in which they have assembled all of the figures they did for the National Civil Rights Museum. They don't appear like this in the museum. They're scattered around the museum, but here in one picture you can see them all. Um, and here you can see the reenactments of, of several well-known photographs. You also can see the inclusion of figures representing the photojournalist and the television news cam cameraman. And I think this is absolutely fascinating. The fact that they themselves are displayed as civil rights actors, as actors documenting their own famous photographs. Um, and at the center sits the woman who, within this broad memory story, perhaps best illustrates its imaginative dimension, Rosa Parks. She is a favorite symbol of civil rights memory, one who, even in her mugshot, seems to invite the viewer, us, into her circumstances, to ask us to join in the process of moral witnessing. Of course, that was the point. She was chosen to be this symbol, the one who was arrested. She was chosen to be the face of segregation and nonviolent protest that was a public, public relations uh, act of the movement. Uh, and yet we've always understood her as a, as a newsmaker. This is the back of a modern day bus featuring an ad for a museum exhibit about the Montgomery bus boycott that followed her arrest. Here is Freeman Tilden's question again. Would you have moved to people in the 21st century? Sculptors of her sit in public parks throughout the country. These two are in Oregon and Texas. Um, she seems to be of radically different ages. <laughs> um, you can see in both cases that someone has given her flowers to hold. And so there's the trace of the connection to the person, even if we don't see the, the person, um, the vernacular act. I haven't been to these either, but I have been inside this, I have been inside this bus, um, oops, <coughs> yes, um, which is a replica of the one on which she was arrested, not the real one, and is inside the National Civil Rights Museum. A couple of years ago, the Memphis Commercial Appeal ran this story about visitors' engagement with her. They try to sit down beside her, they put children on her lap, and sometimes they talk to her. The fact that this famous picture was not of the news event itself, but rather a symbolic restaging a year later that's a reporter behind her, does not deter people from reenacting it, including the pose looking out the window, which is replicated in the statues we just saw. Two years ago, that reenactment was performed by no less than the President of the United States while he was campaigning for re-election in Michigan, which is where the actual bus is, at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. Here's Barack Obama's moment of imaginative connection with Rosa Parks. And this gesture circulated through news coverage involving a bigger group of people, us, in his act of remembering, paying tribute, moral witnessing, of the long, long struggle that had made it possible for him to become president. This is his re-election campaign. News media had made similar gestures when Obama was first inaugurated in 2008. If you look at the, um, the, the quote, which is also a rap song lyric, Rosa Parks sat, sat so Martin Luther King could walk, Martin Luther King walked so Obama could run. 
Martin Luther King Jr. was back in the news again in 2011 when the National Park Service opened a new monument dedicated to him in the National Mall. And then yet again this past August when a major ceremony in Washington, D.C. marked uh, and to some extent reenacted, mainly marked the 50th anniversary of his famous I Have a Dream speech during the 1963 March on Washington. To mark the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Summer Voting Rights Campaign, the museum currently is displaying news photographs from that year in an exhibit that recalls not only history itself, but also journalism's central place within it. The representations of both Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. are good illustrations of how the lasting stories of news flow through all sorts of public communication as they become part of me public memory and are more and more deeply embedded in it, even as that memory changes. These stories begin somewhere in the culture itself, are first broadcast to a wide audience through journalism, but then they travel into other media and other kinds of public communication, from markers and memorials to blogs and buses. Over time, those stories are revised, they are enlarged or refined, <coughs> and at some point they flow back through journalism again. Journalism scholar James Carey argued that we should think of journal, uh, journalism not as a series of single reports, but rather as what he called a curriculum of news, through which we seek multiple perspectives on a particular subject over time. I think that that's what we see here, though not only in terms of journalism. Here we see a curriculum of public memory that reminds us that forms of communication we tend to think of as separate and distinct journalism, advertising, film, art, music, sculpture, landscape, are actually always woven together in our minds, working together in complex ways to shape our lasting understandings of major stories. Also woven together are official and vernacular culture. And these cases remind us that real people assert their status as storytellers as well, whether that is a matter of staking a local claim to a national story or insisting that the nation pay attention, more attention to a local story. To use a phrase coined probably 30 years ago by historian Michael Frisch, ordinary people want to have a shared authority for the past. That really is my conclusion, but I'll finish with a coda, with another example of that shared authority. And here I go back, back to Northern Ireland. This mural is in East Belfast. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. Any of you seen this used elsewhere? Yeah, and it, and it is used, in fact, where, where have you seen it used? I've seen this. You've seen this, yeah. okay. Turns out it, it is in other, a number of sort of social justice campaigns around the world to use this. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. This went up in 2010, and is made up of little pictures of, of the faces of local residents of the neighborhood, of the Shanko neighborhood. Its message, uh, which is a slogan used elsewhere in the world as well, I just said that, um, is a statement about the relationship between official and vernacular culture. It also may be a useful way to understand the relationship between journalism and communities. Belfast is full of murals, telling two sides of the story of a very violent <coughs> conflict that lasted for decades, known as the Troubles or the Conflict, depending on your point of view. Um, a conflict that involves religion, but is mainly about full Irish independence from Great Britain, and the fact that Ireland remains a divided country. I've been there several times, and I'm going back there this summer, partly because I'm fascinated by these murals. Few of them are this pleasant. Instead, many of them look like this. This is one from each side. They're quite violent and political. So there's this. But I'm also fascinated by how Belfast is now trying to market itself as a tourism destination. This involves the Titanic, because the Titanic was built there. And they have a new Titanic experience, visitor destination. They have, they've tried to rejuvenate the waterfront area. Similar, many, many cities, post-industrial cities have done the same thing. Um, I went to it when it opened. I happened to be teaching our Temple London program, so. Um, off I went to the Titanic experience. This is meant to put Belfast on the map in a new way, to rewrite the city's story by remembering its importance a century ago, sort of jumping over <laughs> um, the troubles. Their tourism people haven't yet figured out 
whether to try, try to hide or promote the political murals. And right now they're doing a weird combination of both that also involves the peace process and political prisoners who are involved in giving walking tours, um, that some, some, several of which I have taken. It's a strange mix um, because that's tourism too. In understanding Belfast public art, I hope to use some of the ideas I've talked about today. I'm especially interested in understanding a particular rhetorical turn that some of the nationalist murals, Catholic side, West Belfast, have taken in recent years. And here's one of them. This is in West Belfast, right next to the Peace Wall, which is not as lovely as the name sounds. Part of it is a military-style gate that is shut and locked at night to keep the peace, you know, so people don't go out into the streets and kill each other. Uh, this community, and the gate is right, that's, and, and that, that, the, that road is closed at night, as well as the sidewalk gate. And you can see some of the barbed wire, and there's a, between the neighborhoods, there's a much bigger wall with barbed wire at the top of it, separating the Protestant and Catholic neighborhoods. This community, which was once West Belfast, which was once defined in news coverage and internationally understood as terrorists, now has reframed their story, quite convincingly, I would add, as the story of a long struggle for civil rights that aligns historically with the racial discrimination against African Americans and the ultimate freedom they gained. This is quite a turn in public memory. So this is my latest, um, you're doing what, um, topic. You're going where this summer? Um, I'm drawn to it because it is a good and very complicated example of the relationship between vernacular and official narratives, an example of an international news story that is expressed on the local landscape in quite different ways. It is a modern day case study in Maurice Holbrook's definition of memory as a painting in which new images overlay the old. What's more, this is a story like that of the American Civil Rights Movement that many people believe is over. Yet present day events and present day uses of the past suggest otherwise. It is an unfinished story. And on that unfinished note, I will inconclusively conclude. Thank you for listening to my thoughts, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. happened on the second day of our class. It was perfect, but I didn't know what the news coverage was going to be like, but we all sort of studied it. Um, and there was an overt effort made, because 
some folks are still alive. You know, John Lewis is, is still, he really is a, an example of a living in his body testimony because he was beaten up um, during voting rights marches. Uh, but, but he and, and other speakers went out of their way to say this, this was a march for jobs. We've forgotten the word jobs, which was in the, not for economic equity as well as freedom to you know, cast your vote. Um, and so, I th and I think that, that that was an example of what, what do you want to call it, counter memory, or recomplicating the memory that becomes sim uh, simplified. And yet, there are a lot of people who, who uh, over time, noted how Martin Luther King Jr. himself has been de radicalized yes. and was once a very radical figure. Instead, he's this really sort of happy figure in history, the, the peaceful um, visionary, um, and, and he had much more radical things to actually say in his lifetime, which may be a difference between memory uses and history itself. Um, and you bring up a lot of really interesting, the, the thorniest questions of, of, of that relationship between memory and history and the local and the national. Thank you. Just to follow with Christina's point, like, if you had a definition of like vernacular diversity or something to that effect. Ah, that was actually that was and, and I and I was using the word diversity in a different way, in a in a non-racial way or any rate. Uh, and the point was, which is a point that uh, historian John Bodnar makes about vernacular culture, um, which is that you can't predict it. <laughs> That's what I meant. The diversity of, of vernacular culture is that it's all sorts of stuff. And, and we can kind of predict the national symbols in a better way than we can predict what people will bring to places. And in, in, his, in the, the, the book where he talks about this, which has been around for a while now, he was talking about the centennial of the Civil War, which was um, done at the time of terrible civil rights um, violence. And so the, the planners had, had to say, what are we going to do? Are we going to reenact the Civil War when we've got all of this trouble going on? And, and, and so there was a national commission for to, to create the official story that was inclusive. But the problem was that people went out on their own and they dressed up and they shot up things and they did, you know, that they couldn't stop the reenactors. And they couldn't stop them from kind of reenacting history, reclaiming racism. And, and that was why he was saying, you just, you can't predict what real people will do. And they may do, do something in a way that, that if they do it, for long enough, I think they make it very difficult to reinstate the national official memory. I think it's what we see in Shanksville. Well, like what I meant by that was like, you used the term real people and then and the definition of ordinary people, but who gets to define that? Yeah. Like, when we're talking about class or sexual orientation or gender, because it seemed like a lot of, like in the beginning with Shanksville, like a lot of gender roles were heroic men and weeping women, and they had a lot of victims who were uh, people of color, but they were rep rep represented in like people driving. Like when we say ordinary people are real people, I think it kind of obscures maybe class or a lot of other like intersectional uh, categories. And also, do we define ordinary? Are they ordinary because they were the victims? Because they were inactive, or do we need to rewrite the story to make them active? Um, and to, although that's the point of identification though too. And, and this is, and that's the difficult side of that too. Um, if they are like us essentially, uh, and this is essentialism, if, if they are, if, if we identify with them based on the imaginative connection, which is how would I feel, then a lot of the other stuff goes away, at least for the purposes of how that story is. Oh, but I think you raise an excellent question because, you know, is it, how, and how do we, like, going back to John Lewis, is he an ordinary person? He once was. He's not, and, you know, he's a leader. Um, it, is it defined by race, is it, or is it defined by exclusion? Uh, as opposed to, it, the more included you are, or the more official your narrative is. Thank you. Great set of questions. Uh, I'm really interested in your idea of moral response stories being the ones that survive. Yeah. Uh, I'm really curious about how the relationship is between that and time. So I'm thinking in part with the 24-hour news cycle, but even more so with viral social media. Whose morality and how do we interpret our moral frames given that the new, the, what's the news story today is not going to be the news story, not even tomorrow, but in the next three hours, there's going to be another story popping up. How, 
how do we have time for more processing, both as consumers and as users of this journalistic media? I actually think with um, the 24-hour news cycle, which as long ago as the 1920s was called um, uh, the information uh, information overload. <laughs> and it was on the Time magazine because people couldn't keep up with all the news in 1923. Um, I actually think it increases the power of the recognizable image, right? The image we have seen before. Sociologist Barry Schwartz calls these frame images. Uh, an, an easy to remember example is the, the is the three firemen raising the American flag at the World Trade Center site. And everyone knew that was the image because it was Eagle Jim. Um, and, and there are, I mean, there are, and the, the recognizable characters. But because, because these stories flow through culture in different ways, and, we, and they're retold in songs, and we kind of forget this, uh, the point I was making at the end is that they're in our heads in these really complicated ways. So that if we see the right trigger in the middle of all of this information flying past us, it's the only thing we remember. Yeah, so, so I think it increases the memory. My question is really, does that, uh, information overload then allows us to select things that already fit into our own ethical frameworks. I would well, I'm I'm cynical about that. Yeah. I mean I think I mean I think for cultural reasons that aren't that are it's a technological aspect of a cultural process that we recognize what makes common sense to us, right? What makes it we see what makes sense to us and we remember that. There's another aspect of, of, of this business of what gets remembered that I I have talked about in the, in the past, I didn't get into it today, but I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with uh, the work of sociologist Herbert Gams, um, who in the 1960s and 70s went into newsrooms of the three net broadcast networks and, and type Newsweek and the New York Times, and, and to, to figure out what he called values of the news, eternal values of the news, um, and, and how order and disorder, Is, has anyone read Gams? Uh, okay, or, it, it, it says the news is basically about stories of order and disorder. The news is disorder. The idea is how we tell stories that, res that restore the order. We talked about four kinds of disorders. And they are, now I'm going to forget them, they are technological, moral, um, natural, and something else. Oh, hell. Like technological, moral, disorder, and social. So, you know, protesters or crime. Um, and in stories with, and this is not, he didn't say this, I'm saying this. In stories with all four kinds of disorders, those also turn into the most powerful memory stories and are more likely to travel into <coughs> other forms of representation. Hurricane Katrina is an excellent example of it. The Titanic is another. A lot of them involve water. A Johnstown flood is it, because there's a moral dimension, there's a social dimension, there's a technological dimension, there's a, it rained a lot, there was an iceberg, you know, and, 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 and it, because they are such powerful stories imaginatively, it's all kind of woven together. And that's not, I, I continue to dodge your question, but, I, but, but, but no, I mean, pe people say, well, oh, well, social media changes all of this. I don't think it does. I think it, I mean, I think it strengthens it. Yes, sir. Interested in two strategies that I see emerging in these types of memorialization. One we could call like myelin type abstract art that'll you know kind of forces one to look at an event and you know maybe evoke something like the sublime, right? So you the individual does the work. And the other is something much more realistic in this and, and almost um, you know, in the way that popular culture is sometimes called kitsch because it's a recognition of, I know that. Could you be, please stop using that word. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> With an S. There's no for it's no S. But do go on. But such, such that, you know, so, um, like when we hear music we've heard a zillion times on the radio, what stimulates our sensational relation to is, I recognize that. And so many of these things are very literal, recreations of these iconic images that reinforce a, a certain memory. And I'm wondering, you know, in relation to thinking about monumental memory, you know, kind of Nietzsche's idea about monumental memory being, the trouble with it is that it casts a shadow over the present, making us unable to live. Um, I wonder which, if you have developed a kind of normative framework for thinking about these things, and which strategy you think is more healthy or, or problematic. I'm 
not sure how to answer that. What, what are you asking me? I'm asking. Have, have I developed a moral, a, a, a theoretical a moral, moral framework for what? A normative what? thinking about this where you can make judgments about, say, say the 93 uh, monument there where they allow, it's kind of abstract with names and it allows people to, the way that the Vietnam Memorial does, where part of it is people coming and, and doing the pilgrimage thing right. versus these, you know, it's, it's striking the, the one with the fire hose where they're forcing you as if yeah. into a certain kind of memory, you know, in relation to the, to the object. If you have a kind of normative framework through which you can evaluate these different strategies. Um, uh, well, I, I think that I, I find very interesting that uh, at a time in, 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 uh, in which there's so much sort of cultural discussion and scholarship about you know what's beyond postmodern post postmodern reflexivity um, and the fragmentation of the self. I, I, which would make us think, well, the abstract art is going to do something that sort of uh, liberates our uh, ability to um, to reconnect the parts of our, you know, to think our way through it, so that so that we tell, sort of tell, told the story of ourself through. And yet, I, I'm so struck by how literal a lot of the responses are. Not because people are stupid, but because people are they want to say something um, in a way that is for the next visitor to understand. That, that social process is so old media and is so centered. It's not decentered. It's, it's so, um, and, and, and the signing of the names just blows my mind. I mean, especially the people who took the sign to a field that was a construction site. You couldn't even drive up to anymore. It, that's, that is really something. Um, I mean, I think that there is, I, I think that there is, a, is, is not as modernist. I mean, it's, it is, um, a, I think, a desire for, um, a, a communicative process, rather than merely a, a reflexive or ident inward identity process. It's more of an outer process. I think that's probably a very, very bad answer to your question, a very sophisticated question. But thank you. Along that line, I was, I'm absolutely fascinated by this, this idea of communicating with the dead, somehow leaving this piece of yourself. And I was wondering, as, as an oral historian, if you've had a chance to speak to any of these folks at the, at the memorial site of Flight 93, and if you've had a chance to kind of gauge how that that might aid them in their own in their own understanding of their lives or anything like that. Well, I certainly haven't done that yet because I haven't done IRB in that way. I might have accidentally talked to <laughs> Just out of courtesy. Um, I have not, um, well, first of all, there's the phenomenon of what people write on these cards. And I'll tell you that, that, that when the cards, they started using the cards in the little temporary hut, they were much more diverse in the messages than they are now. Um, in the hut, there were all sorts of political messages. I happened to be there at the time in the mosque, the, the mosque, the, the ground zero, the, the, the mosque. But there were a lot of debates that were specifically about that. A lot of anti-Obama things. They weren't about to get rid of Obama. Have, has Obama been here? It was really like local politics, and a lot of the visitors are local people, and that's true of all the historic sites. Um, and, it, and it was just kind of, it was a much more of a mixture of tone, and now they all say exactly the same thing. All of them. God bless America, thank you for saving our lives. God bless America, you were yours. They all say the same. So that kind of, the, the, the rhetorical, the, the unexpectedness, right, that's the diversity of vernacular culture, I thought was really interesting. I have, I have not, talk to at the site because I don't know who they are and occasionally relatives do go there. And I'm not going to walk up to him, I mean, why are you here? I have, I have Eve's job dropped. <laughs> I, I mean, I just listen to, you know, what people, usually don't, people, people don't say much, they're pretty quiet. I have talked to the park rangers, oh, don't tell IRB. And I've talked to the volunteers over the years. I always talk to them. And the most interesting thing in my most recent visit, that park ranger I showed you, the picture of him, and there were, that was the Boy Scout Jamboree. There were hundreds of people behind me. I was in the second row. Mm -hmm. um, and, and afterwards, I said to him, because there's still obviously local volunteers and they're retirees, and I said, are they also telling that? Because it's a big, big summer Sunday, you get the National Park Ranger, but you know, do the local people still, still tell the story? They, they were called ambassadors, the ambassadors. I said, do any of the ambassadors still, still tell the story? And he made a face and he said, well, 
a few of them really said, we're training them. <laughs> and I thought, but they were the ones who started this. And then I realized, of course, I realized what it meant. The training them to tell it right. Um, and, and so, I mean, and that I thought, wow. Um, so I mean, there, there's a, I don't know, frankly, I don't know quite what I want to ask. Um, but I have this, but they're, um, what I've observed has shaped this. So I haven't written about any of this. This is in my head. Some of the, some of the stuff was in the journals of, of the culture of Greek, the first stuff. I haven't written about Belfast. I haven't written about, I don't know if I'll ever write about civil rights. I'm just so struck by their relationship with journalism and how they reappear in Belfast. Um, so I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of, um, when you were talking about um, the, the civil rights movement and its commemoration may be a little bit sui generis because it has, be, it has become such a part of um, its protagonists, its victims, its antagonists, the, the rightness of the movement have become so much a part of the American mainstream that um, I think it's become really difficult for ordinary people to conceive that, that they themselves um, might have been anything, if they were there, had, might have been anything but her playing the, in the place of the heroic victim. So the question, you know, would you have moved is a really, you know, is a really important one. You know what's another really important one is, would you have stopped the bus if you were the driver? Mm -hmm. um, when living in Memphis, I went back and I, I went to the Civil Rights M Museum many times, and in the, uh, the, the sit-in, the, um, the lunch counter sit-in scene there, over the many visits, I, my attention began to focus on the, on the, um, on the white uh, antagonists on the periphery. What, what are their <coughs> souls like? Who are they? Um, and it seems to me that the, um, there's always a battle over uh, whose narrative is going to be the one that, is, that becomes the official one. Who are, not just who are the winners of the conflict, but who are the winners of public, um, of, in, in public history. So for instance, in the Hollywood blacklist, the winners of, in public history, are the losers in the day. Um, the Ole Miss uh, uh, memorial that you, that you point to, of uh, Meredith walking up to the gate, the text on the gate is not, of Mer is not anything that Meredith said. The text on the gate are the words of the Old Miss Chancellor at the time the um, monument was dedicated. Now, Old Miss hated the idea of Meredith coming there. Um, so this, to me, sounds like, it feels like, you know, Old Miss trying to sort of co-opt or, or even rip away um, its own, um, its own, you know, deep moral culpability here, and essentially place itself in this stereotype narrative of um, all of us were good guys in this in the uh, in this in the civil rights movement um, because we know of its rightness in retrospect, and it, it's it's just um, that that the, the contest over historical memory in the case of the civil rights movement seems to me, as I say, sui generis and quite um, exemplary, though, of, of these kinds of struggles. That's just a... It, it, well, although in a way you raise the same point Christina did, which is, is that a co-optation or is it a, a final triumph? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that we were wrong? If it um, said we were wrong, that would and, be great. And the, other, <laughs> is, the, and the other aspect of civil rights rights cycles that are huge tourism industry. Um, uh, uh, civil rights tourism is a, is a big economic um, boom in the South. And to the extent that there are still these seven foot soldiers who tell the story then, you know, will it be less legitimate when they die? Is it still somewhat legitimate? Do you need the living body that is the, who, who has the authority, the moral authority to tell the story, which is how you say, well, it's not co-opted, even though we've been here on a bus. You know, when the bus full of white people uh, uh, pulled up again. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's just such a fashion, fascinating set of issues. But thank you for telling me that about the um, things that I haven't been there.
Um, so thank you for such a provocative and interesting presentation. Thank you for writing a small plane. Probably. With, and, with Ford in it. <laughs> okay, even better. Um, oh, I was just so quick about the IRB. It's okay, because I'm going through this right now again. I'm taking all my modules. I've got like, I don't know, keep, new ones keep popping up. Even I thought I was done. But it turns out that it's okay. You can talk to the Rangers like you're doing. You can talk to people. It's not that you can't talk to people, but you can't talk to them about themselves. You can talk to them about the project, like a source of information. Everyone should know this, right? That's okay. here, though, Michelle. That's not yeah. necessarily... Yeah, oh. and actually, Temple, oh, Temple's, oh, rule, actually, Temple's rules is that what I want, because I've done this, I did this with the Pennsylvania Public Map. I interviewed oh, you museum people anyone. all over the state. So, and Temple's rule is that what I want to do is exempt, but I have to apply to ask them to say it's exempt. Yeah.